So last week we talked about you. Who are you? We're, we're doing, for those of you who weren't here last week, we're, this year we're doing, we're talking about the mystical body of Christ because you need to understand what the church is. You are the church. The church is Christ. And you are Christ. You're a member. You're part of him. You're part of his mystical body, not his his human body or his, uh, but you are part of him, mystically connected to him through, as we talked about last week, through baptism. Baptism made you a child of God. Who are you? It comes down to that. You are a child of God. What does that mean? And we talked last week about um, being a child of God gives you certain obligations, but it also gives you, there's a reason you're a child of God. There's a purpose. That's what we're talking about today. You are one. If you want to and answer the question, who are you? Are you a child of God? You are one sent by God. Sent by God. What does that mean? Um, it, you, you're, you're, you should be conscious by this time of your origin that God created you. And therefore, you have a mission because God doesn't do anything without a reason. We talked about this last year in apologetics. You're... You also have a destiny. You have a dignity given to you because of baptism, because you've been raised no longer from, from the, the natural world, but to the supernatural world. So you have a new dignity. Just as Christ is ha ha a dignity. That's why when you go into church, you genuflect because he's God. You also have a dignity because now you are united with him. And what is his is yours, as long as you're in sanctifying grace. And that's the caveat, as long as you're in sanctifying grace. That means as long as you are without mortal sin. And we talked about this before. It's not impossible to go through your whole life and never commit a mortal sin. It is extremely possible. Because why? Why? Three things make a sin mortal. The first thing is it has to be grievous matter. It has to be, as we tell the little kids, it has to be big. It has to be very serious. And not all sins that we commit on a daily basis are serious. You have to know that it's serious. You can't. You, you have to know that what, is, what you're going to do is a, a serious thing, that you are going to offend God grievously. And then, and that, this is the biggest part, you have to say, okay, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. Now, you don't have to use those words, but what it means is you have to willingly, you have to give full consent of your will. You can't accidentally commit a mortal sin. You can't be forced into committing mortal sin because you're not giving full consent. And that's the part which makes it you able to go through your whole life possibly without ever committing a mortal sin because as long as you never will it, you never purposely want to commit the mortal sin, you won't commit the mortal sin. Now, unfortunately... There are lots of things out there in the world that tempt us, and we say, oh, well, I, uh, this is for me. I need this. And that's when you're putting yourself in front of God, and you are accepting it for yourself, and you're therefore accepting the consequences. And therefore, you give full consent. Because at that moment, at that time, you think this is the best thing in the world for you. And you give yourself lots of excuses as to why this is a good thing to do this, or why you need this, or why you have to do this. But those excuses don't hold water. You know that when you commit, when you do this, you are committing a mortal sin. And you say, I'm going to do it anyway. Maybe in not those words, but mentally, spiritually, that's what you're saying. So you have... 
as long as you are in sanctifying grace, you have that connection to Christ. You have within you, and that is what grace is. Grace is your connection to Christ. Grace is divinity dwelling inside you, inseparable from you. Most most people out there, most Protestants out there, they have no idea of what grace is. Grace is a good thing. Grace is you know, feeling good. No, grace is none of those things. Grace is a connection to God. Grace is God within you. And you receive it for the first time in baptism. And as long as you keep it, you have that within you. You have God within you. You have that connection to him, that mystical connection that makes you part of him, which makes you a member of the church. Now, you can lose it. You can give it away. You can, by committing mortal sin, but you can get it back because God knows our weaknesses and therefore gave us the sacraments. And through penance, the sacrament of penance, you can get sanctifying grace back and hopefully hold on to it longer. So... You have a dignity because you have grace within you, but you also have a destiny, and that destiny is divine. What does God intend for you? Where does he want you to end up? In heaven with him. So you have a divine destiny. A German neurologist pointed out the mere fact that you are listening to this and understanding it is proof that you were created by a spirit. You think, therefore, he is. Indeed, you are one sent by God. If you study yourself, and that's and, and the purpose of this, this whole, of, of working on the mystical body is to understand what the church is and therefore what's wrong with the church today. But also to help you understand, because you are the church, you need to understand you. And there's left several layers to you. There's as many layers as there are to God because you are a very complex being. But adding that spark divinity to you is adding a whole new dimension. So if you study yourself and don't see within yourself that immense, all-wise, all-powerful, beautiful God that dwells within you, there is not just within you, but outside of you, all around you, everywhere. You haven't studied yourself at all. For that's what rev revelations, the, the so ma majestically testifies. Reason also tells you that there is a God and that he is within you and he's around you and that he is here for you. We talked about heresies, humanism being the basis for all the other heresies. Humanism puts forward the value of each human being apart from God. And that's the problem with the heresy of humanism. It separates humanity from divinity, and it doesn't want God in the picture. Man is everything. But there is another heresy that's an offshoot of that, and that is that heresy teaches that the human individual is of no importance. That you are, the, and you, you, if, remember that the, the humanism grew out of the Renaissance and it probably, I wouldn't say reached its peak, but one of its worst periods was during the, the time of the French Revolution. Man was important, man was everything, Free, uh, liberty, equality, fraternity, that was, the, you know, our brotherhood with each other. But at the same time, what was going on at that, in that, they were killing each other. You had a reign of terror. Man didn't, even though they were raising up man's dignity, he's so great. At the same time, he was worth nothing because... If you don't go along with society, man's value, remember, humanism bases your value is what your value to society. And if you have no worth as far as society is concerned, then you should be done away with. And that's why that same period in time gave birth to the Industrial Revolution where men were just cogs in a wheel. 
the value individual their individual worth was how much work could you put out. And now in this day and age, it's, you could be replaced instead of by a machine, you can be replaced by a robot or something. So this it teaches that the individual, the human individual has no importance, that you're totally dispensable, that you're negligible, that there is your and nations have looked upon you as expendable. Yeah, they, they talk about human rights and things like that, but they if you're in their way, they'll mow you down. If you go against whatever the status quo is, what society decides is the important issue here, then get out of the way. You're, they'll, they'll mow you down. You're not worth anything. You're only worth what, as far as you back up the status quo in, in society. Um, that's why social media is so important these days. If you're not going, if you're not going along with what they're saying in social media, you will become an outcast. As an individual, you're not considered indispensable, and you don't count in the scheme of things. But the truth remains: you are important, as far as God's concerned. God sent you. He's He has a job for you. Never has God created a man or woman that is indispensable. Each of you has a job. He created you for a reason. Before the world came to be, you already existed in the mind of God. And he already knew what your job in his plan would be. You're not indispensable. There's not a single person on the face of this earth at this moment that's unnecessary to omnipotence because he created them. If, if he didn't need you or want you, he wouldn't have made you because he's all wise. And wise people do not do things for no reason. So the fact that you are here, that you exist, there is a reason for your existence. You just have to figure out what it is. And if you don't figure it out, I'll tell you sooner or later. So you're not only one sent by God, but you're sent with a purpose. No intelligent person acts without a purpose. And God is an intelligent person, so he had a purpose. He created you, and so, and he also keeps you in existence. Therefore, until you die, until you're... you're you cease to exist, there's a reason for you being in this world. You just, maybe you don't know what it is, but there is a reason for you being here, and you have to figure out what that reason is. You were creating God's own image, and <coughs> some have said, our, um, Bishop Fulton Sheen being one of them, that God was in love, and he could not keep the secret. So he told everything in creation. God was in love. He, he created you because he loved you. And everything that he made, as it says, is good. But you are different than plants and animals. He, it, he made those for you. And when you messed up the whole plan, I don't mean you specifically, well, yes, but Adam and Eve, when they messed up the whole plan, um, he sent his son to, to fix it, to put everything back right, because, again, he loves you. God did not call from the depths of nothingness to summon you without a purpose. He loves you. He wanted you. And that purpose was for himself. God created you for himself. God made you first for himself. And then he made, just as he made everything for himself. But when it said that God made you for himself, we're not saying that he's selfish. Only somebody who's imperfect can be selfish. 
somebody who's perfect, who has everything and doesn't need anything, can't be selfish. He's being generous when you say he made you for himself because he's willing to share with you what he is, which is everything. It's the opposite of selfishness. When we do something for ourselves, we're selfish, but then we're imperfect. We, we look around and we see something we want to acquire. And that's because we're imperfect. We always reach out to get something that will increase our perfection. And that's why we think, oh, I want that money. I, I need that job because it will increase my perfection. But because we are imperfect. But if you were imperfect, you wouldn't see it that way. He, God doesn't want to acquire anything. When he, he wants to communicate. He wants to give to us. He wants us to understand. And this is because he loves us. He, what does he want to communicate? His goodness. He wants to share it with us. Love acted. Love acted for himself. Remember, he is love. He acted for himself. You are once sent by God to manifest him in a manner that no human before you and no human on earth with you and no human that may come after you or could or ever would be able to manifest him. Manifest. What does manifest mean? To show him. You have to show him to the world. How are you going to show him to the world? Remember, he's part of you. You have to show that part to the world. That's how you manifest him. You have to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, said our Lord. And then you will manifest him. Because people looking at you will not see you. They will see him. They will see his perfection, his love, his beauty. But through you. Now, here's life's most exciting truth. Yours once sent by God to manifest him in a manner that no human before, no human on earth with you, and no human, uh, no other human can manifest him. That is a truth. You have something of God in you that no one else in creation except for you can display. Look at all the saints. that man, They all manifested God, but they all did it differently. In no two are exactly the same. No two show forth God in exactly the same way. But remember that God has so many facets to his being that you can never run out of different ways to manifest him. Consider all the human beings that ever lived, ever will live, add them all up in the billions and trillions of people. Each one of them, if they did what they were supposed to do and manifested God, would be doing it in a different way. They would be showing a different side of God, a different face, a different facet. You have something to manifest, which if you fail to show, will be lost to man, to the world, and in a sense, even to God. This is how important you are as an individual. Import, importance to omnipotence himself. You are one sent by God for a very specific purpose, not just any purpose that you can pick and choose. God chose you for a specific person, purpose. But it's not enough for you to be vibrantly conscious of the fact that you're sent by God or that you're sent for a purpose. You have to know what that purpose is. Yes, you're supposed to manifest him, but how? As I said, each of the saints manifests God in a different way. How are you supposed to manifest him? How do you, you have to figure that out. So for only this, if only if you do that, fulfill that purpose, are you able to give lie to the modern heresy, which would make you infinitesimal of no significance? 
you are, if you don't do that, then yes, you are exactly what the world says. You're dispensable because you're not doing what God intended you to do. To know that you have a mission from Almighty God and for Almighty God, which no one else in the universe can discharge, is a challenge to the best that is in you. You, who but a few short years ago were absolutely nothing, are now a living human being that can radiate eternal life. You are considered by the powerful earth as completely negligible. You, but you are now on earth by God's command and thanks to God's continued action, you are able to show forth some shadow of the omnipotence and make manifest in your own particular way the goodness that is the essence of God. That is what your mission is. How can you fulfill it? How can you, who know something of your ever wavering will and all of your weaknesses, ever measure up to the demand of, of God? That question brings you face to face with the only problem in your life. How are you ever going to be true to yourself? And that goes back to the very first question of who are you? Deep down, inside, intimately, you need to figure that out. You need to know who you are and what are your problems? What are your faults? What are your virtues? What are your vices? What are your temptations? You have to go deep down inside you and find out. To be true to yourself is a challenge of staggering proportions. Well might you wonder how you are to do it if, if God had not given you a detailed directions and just how to fulfill your mission. He gave, he, God left us. God had a plan, and he didn't keep the plan secret. A good general knows that in war, and you have a plan, a strategy for battle, you need, don't keep it secret. You have to let all your top men know what the plan is so that if you die, they can continue the job. Now, that's not going to be an issue with God dying, but he wants all of us to know what the plan is and what our part in it is going to be so that if we fall down and fail, somebody else can pick it up. St. Paul answered, gives the answer to what... Um, the detailed plans, the directions. He has chosen you in Christ before the foundation of the world to be a saint, to be blameless in his sight for the love of him, marking you out beforehand to be his adopted child through Jesus Christ. Thus he would manifest the splendor of that grace by which he has taken you into his favor in the person of his beloved son. We're back to the mystical body. It was his loving design centered in Christ to give history his fulfillment by resuming everything in him, all that is in heaven, all that is in on, on earth, summed up in him. In him, it was your lot to be called singled out beforehand to suit his purpose, which is to manifest his glory. There is God's eternal purpose underlined. You are to manifest his glory. How? By living in Jesus Christ. Again, the mystical body. Paul talks about it so often, but he does it in such a way that you really have to kind of root down a little bit to figure out what it is he's actually talking about. St. Peter also talks about it. Remember, this is a dogma that has existed from the very beginning of the church. Peter and Paul, is, uh, Paul constantly talking talks about it, but he doesn't call it the mystical body. He talks about it like he did here, that you are connected to Jesus Christ, that you have to work in him and through him and with him. 
Then comes the truth, which is the foundation of your life and all of your living. And this is, again, a quotation from St. Paul. He has put everything under his dominion and made him the head to which the whole church is joined. This is St. Paul. So that the church is his body, the completion of him, who everywhere and in all things is complete. This is a stumbling block to the, to the Protestants and the Gentiles and everybody else. How, how can someone who is complete, God is not in, incomplete. God is complete. And yet he wants you to complete himself. St. Paul says this. So that the church is his body, the completion of him who everywhere and in all things is complete. Christ is the head to which you are joined, and you're a member of the church, which is his body. You are the completion of him who everywhere and in all things is complete. Contradictions. God is full of contradictions. Puzzles. How can there be three persons in one God? How can someone who is to be divine take on a human nature? God loves puzzles. The last puzzling phrase contains the heart of the solution to this whole problem of you, your life and your life's work. Just as the head is complete by the rest of the body, so Christ is completed in his mission as Savior by the church, which continues to prolong his work through time and space. Christ came to save. He did this by dying on the cross. We call that redemption. Christ redeemed, but he did not completely save. The, the salvation of the world He as, is done by his mystical body, not by his physical body. His physical body worked out redemption, his mystical body works out salvation. And you are part of the mystical body, of which he is the head. You are part of that mystical body. So part of your purpose, your way of manifesting him, is cooperating in the salvation of the world. That job is left to us through him. In turn, he supplies the members with all of the graces. Thus, you see that he completes and is completed. God the Father has appointed Christ as the universal head of the church, which is the complement of him, who in all things is made complete by means of us all. In a way, you can, I mean, this whole idea of the mystical body is that how much different is it than when you think of the mystery of the Trinity? That there are three persons in one God, and yet in the mystical body of Christ, there are thousands of persons in one Christ. How much different? It's still Christ. The church is Christ. Who are you? You're a part of Christ. You are meant to complete Christ. You are to fill out the very Son of God. That's why you were born, why you were sent by God to give testimony to the light. That's a quotation. You are one sent by God to give testimony to the light. This is from St. Luke. God is to shine through you. You are the lamp for the light of the world. You are the flame in the firebrand Christ came to throw upon the earth and which he was in agony to see ablaze. Christ said that himself. I am, I am, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and I, I am, I can't remember the word you straightened. I'm, in other words, in pain, until it be accomplished. You are one sent by God to continue Christ's incarnation. His incarnation in other human beings, His birth in them to help him complete his work of redemption. 
by your part in the salvation of their souls. Believe that with all of your being. You will be ready to see that life has meaning and that and your, uh, your destiny and your importance to it. That you are actually someone that God needs. That's what we'll talk about next time. How God, God needs you. God doesn't need anything. In this sense, God does need you. We talked about this before, and I don't want to go too far into it now because we'll talk about it next time, but the vine and the branches, vines don't bear fruit. Fruit is born on the branches. You are the branch. He's the vine. He is the head. You are the hands. You have to do the work. He designed it. He plans it. He wills it. He gives you the graces you need, but he leaves it in your hands because you are his hands to carry it out. God does need you. Why? To fulfill that purpose, to manifest himself to the world, to save souls. So that's what we'll talk about next week. Another facet of the mystical body, the how much Christ needs you. So, any questions? See why I like Father Raymond. He says it so, so well, so nicely. It just says, and so easy, it's so easy to understand, and yet the same, by the same token, so above my head. <laughs> you can think about it for long, long periods of time and still think of other things. Yes, Luna? Um, it's um, if it makes you happy and if you have, again, if they're giving praise to God, just because it was written by a Protestant, I don't have, I, I often sing when, when I, not now, but when I was in high school, a lot of contemporary songs that I would especially love songs. I used to sing to God. I mean, he was the one I was addressing, but they were contemporary love songs. It, as long as it, God knows what you mean by it. Um, a lot of their songs, they borrowed from us anyway. But <laughs> So why shouldn't we borrow from them too? So any other questions? As long as it, what it, Grace always defend, and we haven't gotten to that as far as the mystical body is concerned, but grace always comes down to what, what was the intention? And are you in sanctifying grace? You can gain merit from anything. You can make gain merit from washing dishes, so why shouldn't you gain merit from singing a song, even if it was written by a Protestant? If it gives praise to God, so does washing the dishes give praise to God. Do it, do it your own way, but make sure you do what, like Father says, your, your own duties of your state first and then do the other things besides. Yes? Can I ask a question? Sure. Is it disrespectful to wear two scapulars? Or... No. I wear spy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> technically I wear six because this is also a scapular. But I do, I mean, there are a number of people who wear what they call the five-fold scapular. And that's, there are five scapulars. Scapular, the sacred heart, um, the scapular of the trinity, the scapular of immaculate conception, the scapular of our lady of sorrows, and the brown scapular. And these are only a few. There's a purpular scapular of protection. There's, uh, most religious orders have their own scapulars, not there are only a few scapulars that actually get, have have special blessings attached to them. I mean, uh, all those scapulars do have certain blessings attached, but there's certain promises attached to the brown scapular that if you wear it, you know, what will happen? The purple, sc purple scapular also, uh, even though that's not a religious order, it's a confraternity, that also has certain uh, promises of protection attached to it for this day and age.
time. You know, the, um, but the Brown's Gap Pillar, again, the, the, the promises attached to it are that anyone clothed in it will not go to hell. Hey, that's a big reason to wear it. The other scapulars are mostly, and, and then if you wear it and you fulfill the, the further requirements, Our Lady promised to take you out of purgatory the Saturday after you die. That's a big, that's a big promise. The other scapulars there, the Sacred Heart, the Our Lady of Sorrows, or Immaculate Conception Trinity, those are, those are just devotions to those particular titles, Our Lady of Sorrows, uh, her immaculate conception, just to give her honor and glory um, the, to the Sacred Heart. Uh, again, out of love and devotion. But you don't, you don't. There's no particular promise that when you wear it, you like the brown scap, you wear it, you'll get out of purgatory. You wear it, you, you know, it's it will help make you holier because all real, all sacramentals influence us toward holiness. Holy water, anything. So, um, yes, you can answer your question. Yes, you can wear more than one scapular. Don't get, don't go overboard and wear a zillion of them. Or the same with medals. My mother had so many medals that it was like she had a pouch around her with full of medals. It was so heavy that not, I, don't know, I think it was a penance just wearing it. This, but no. Um, no, it was. It's not disrespectful. Any other questions about anything? Nope.